In February of this past year, there was an unusual outpouring of God at a small college in Wilmore, Kentucky. Anybody remember that? A um, pretty ordinary chapel service at Asbury University uh, turned into a over two-week uh, ongoing service of confession and of praise and of life change. It's not a new phenomenon to us, right? It's repeated itself a number of times in the course of history. We can go back to the Great Awakening that took place in the mid-1700s to the Second Great Awakening in the mid-1800s to the Chicago Revival under D.L. Moody uh, in the late 1800s to the Azusa Pacific uh, Revival, Street Revival in Los Angeles in the early 1900s to the revivals around the ministry of Billy Sunday, even in this valley, uh, to then even the uh, ministry of Billy Graham, on and on and on. Listen, all movements of God, not man, all movements of God that lead people to confession and praise, and they result in life transformation. Here's an account of an isolated uh, revival that took place at Wheaton College in 1995, much like that of Asbury this past year. It said that uh, it started on Sunday evening, March 19th, uh, there was a small, relatively small gathering of students that were gathered to listen to the testimony of two students that came uh, from Howard Payne University in Texas to share about the reality of revival on their campus. The two students just shared what God was doing. There was no manipulation. There wasn't any uh, long just as I am at the end of the service. There wasn't even any music at the end of the service. But something happened in that small gathering in that chapel at Wheaton College in which God seemed to just move upon students' heart to confess their sins. Public confession of sins. So students just started standing up and confessing uh, the sins, their brokenness before God. And believe it or not, everybody else in the place didn't go, man, I'm glad I'm not him. No, what they did is they gathered around those students and they began to pray for those students and uplift them and encourage them. And, and this small chapel service that started at 7.30 went to 6.30 the next morning. And whereas there were uh, three, 400 people in that chapel, those people began to leave to go get friends. And by the end of that time, there were 700 students in that chapel confessing, confessing their sins and worshiping God. Well, they decided to break it at that point, but they decided they would get back the next night. So at 9.30 the next night, they regathered on March 20th. There were now 1,000 students in the chapel. They again began to praise and worship, which led to more confession and prayer. And that service continued till 2 a.m. The next night, about 1,300 students gathered in the chapel. And after a time of praise and worship, a time of confession followed again. And finally, on Thursday night, after four straight nights of praise and confession, it was time to celebrate. There were over 1,500 students in that Wheaton College chapel for a great foretaste of what heaven is going to be like. Many still turn back to that moment, that spontaneous, spirit-filled revival as a major turnaround, not only for Wheaton College, but many other campuses as well. It really is an amazing picture, and the reason that I share it is its similarity to where we find ourselves this morning in Nehemiah 9. In Nehemiah 9. Let me invite you to turn there. Um, in the pew Bibles in front of you, it's on page 404. If you have your Bibles, you get extra credit points this morning. No, not really. Uh, but it's great that you would bring it, that you might open it, keep it open. So after you see those two Chronicles things, there's a little book called Ezra. And right after that is Nehemiah. I encourage you to get there. Or you folks that love your phones, you can call it up. and It's N-E-H-E-M-I-A-H-9, right? I'm doing that. Yeah, ESV, if you'd like. I want you to remember what's happening uh, as we turn to Nehemiah 9. Uh, it's, a, it's a people who have been in exile, right? Uh, years ago, forced from their, uh, the city of Jerusalem and from the land that God had given them to live elsewhere under the rule of first Babylon and then Assyria and Persia. But now they're beginning to return to Jerusalem. 
Uh, The book of Ezra accounts the reality of the rebuilding of the temple. And the first part of Nehemiah we got to see was the account of the rebuilding of the wall. Miraculously, in 52 days from beginning to end, these people have rebuilt this two and a half mile wide, or two two and a half mile long wall around Jerusalem. And I remember preaching to you very unimpressed at that point and you still look relatively unimpressed. This is an amazing reality. But, but that first half of the book, it doesn't end there, right? Nehemiah 7 doesn't conclude this book. And it's because God has greater purposes than building a wall. God wants to rebuild a nation. And so at the end of chapter 7, you see 50,000 people listed as coming back to Jerusalem. And last week, uh, uh, Matthew so well took Nehemiah 8 and and shared with you how the reading of the law became instrumental in the building again of those people. And it brings us to Nehemiah 9. The people have been hearing the law. They've been obeying the law. And I was reminded this week of a Dan Allender quote that said, if we mess with the gospel... The gospel will mess with us. (laughs) And he means that in all the very positive ways, right? If we allow the gospel to take impact, to influence in our lives, it's going to mess with us. And and I would say in what they're experiencing in Nehemiah 8 is that when the word of God messes with us, it it will mess with us. And it messes with them, and you'll see that in a very revival-like setting in Nehemiah 9. And my prayer is this morning is that as we address the word of God, with all my love, that it'll mess with you and bring transformation even to our lives, even this morning. In chapter 9, we see another picture of revival, as well as a firsthand look at an amazing prayer that we'll get to. And I do trust that God, by his spirit, will take these, his very words, And use them in our lives for not only our good, but the good of this community, of this valley, and of the world at large. So, Nehemiah 9, just look at the very first five verses. And I just want to get you again into the picture of what is happening here in Nehemiah 9. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth, and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners, and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place, and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day, and for another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. And on the stairs of the Levites stood Yeshua, Bani, not Bono, but Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Bani the second, and I don't know, and Chenaniah. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Hear their cry as confession. Then the Levites, Yeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashbaniah, Sherebiah, Hodai, Shebaniah, and Pethesiah, yeah, them, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Hear praise. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. What's going on? in those five verses. Well, the people have just come off the celebration of the Feast of Booths. So they've brought the law, Ezra brought the law out. They begin to read the law. In the law, they find out that it's time, right? Rosh Hashanah, they should be celebrating the Feast of Booths. And so they just become obedient. They begin to build their booths. And for 22 days, they celebrate this Feast of Booths. It's to remind them of their time in the wilderness and God's faithfulness to them, even in the midst of their sin. And it says here at the beginning of 9, that they're on the 24th day of this month, which would probably like our October, right? And and the the celebration of the Feast of Booths is over, but it's messed with them. (laughs) And so what do we find them doing? That as, as, As they are struck by God's goodness, they are suddenly overwhelmed by their sinfulness. Hear that. As they're struck by the goodness and the greatness of God, they're all of a sudden struck by the reality of their sinfulness. And so we see them in this picture, day 24, returning to their sorrow over their sin. 
They're assembled with fasting. They're assembled with sackcloth and with earth on their heads, and they begin to publicly confess their sins. But also hear that they have not wavered on the daily reading of the book of the law. A quarter of their day is involved in standing and listening to the word read, and now a quarter of their day is given to worshiping God and confessing their sin, which brought me to a brilliant idea. Tomorrow, we're going to meet in here, right? And for a quarter of your day, we're just going to read the book of the law, and then for the next quarter of the day, you're all just going to confess your sin. Everybody coming? Right? I mean, feel the weight of that reality, right? Right? Uh, the, 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 the intensity of this moment. And, and notice the progression from chapter 8. Uh, they've moved from just being sorrow for, for their sin to now confessing their sin. It's like, I'm really sorry, Mom, that I got caught with my hand in the cookie jar to, oh, man, I'm a selfish, no good, nothing, hungry little boy with my hand in the cookie jar, right? You, you hear the change from... Eight to nine. And, and then take a look at how this is done. Uh, this may be a bit confusing. The names tend to get us all tongue tied and pulled up. But what is really happening is there's a, a group of Levites gathered on the stairs, assuming the stairs of this huge expanse with 50,000 people in front of them at the water gate. And they cry out to the Lord the confession of the people as a nation. They said, This is what has been going on, this is why we are broken. While there are Levites stationed across the way who respond to the confession of sin with praises to a gracious God. So there's this really cool liturgy going on. We're lousy, God is great. Oh, by the way, we're lousy, God is great. Oh, by the way, we're lousy, great is God, God is great. And this is happening in the midst of the assembly. It might seem a bit confusing at first, but in reality, it's just a beautiful picture of what is necessary for revival. It's the ridding out of the sin replaced by the love and presence of a forgiving God. So here's a thought as we head into this prayer that takes the rest of Nehemiah 9. Your personal revival, even here this morning, necessitates a breathing out of sin. And a breathing in of God's goodness. We're just going to learn how to spiritually breathe this morning. Exhaling our sin and inhaling the goodness of God. To join the 50,000 who are in the water gate in Nehemiah 9 who are exercising this even there. So we're going to try to go quickly through it. It would be a great study to go back and look at more definitively. But we're going to try to walk through this prayer. So see the prayer. It's in verses 6 through verse 37. We're going to take it in chunks because what I want you to see is the systematic way in which the Levites, as they pray for these people and as the people pray together, of spiritually breathing, of inhaling and exhaling. You ready? Still got your Bibles open? Here we go. Verse 6 of Nehemiah 9. Hear this beautiful inhale. You are the Lord. You alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land that they're actually standing on of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Ammonite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite, and you have kept your promise for you are righteous. Father God, you even saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea. And you performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers. And you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. 
by a pillar of cloud then you led them in the day and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and you spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go and to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. Pause. Inhale. <laughs> the goodness and the greatness of a mighty, mighty God. You, you hear what he's, they're, they're doing? They're, they're, they're outlining creation. <laughs> that all that God made, they're, they're talking about Genesis 12, that God has chosen and to make a covenant with his people through Abraham. Then they fast forward to Egypt. They've delivered them from slavery. You've even brought them to the sea, and you split the sea, and then into the wilderness where you have provided for them. I just want to take a pause. We're going to do this a number of times, and just say, listen, I, those things are all biblical history, which meant a lot to the 50,000 standing in the water gate that day. But what about you? What is it that you can inhale today? that you know is the goodness of God. The ways in which he provided for you, the miracles that he's done in your life, the faithfulness that he has shown you, the ways in which he has delivered you. Inhale. Allow that to fill your lungs. Inhale. Then look at verse 16. Verses 17. But, I always tell you there are a number of big buts in the Bible. This is one of them. God, you've been so good, but here come the Levites on the other side. They and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. In fact, they refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. God, you are so good. Inhale. Oh, but we got to exhale. <laughs> like, you did all of that, and we still rebelled. We still turned our back on you. We still stiffened our neck to the reality of your heart. Our hearts became hard as stone when you were doing everything to make them soft as flesh. Mindful of all that you've done, we still did not obey. In fact, we even wanted to go back to slavery in Egypt. And if you're writing a script, you might think, well, that's the end of that, right? God was so good, they weren't gone. Like, if, if I'm God, that, 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 that's it. But that's not how the prayer ends. Look at 17b. But, <laughs> but you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. You ready to inhale? Listen, God, you did everything. We refused to obey. And yet you still loved us. In 18, he goes on, even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Crazy moment. And committed great blasphemies. God, you in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. And you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner so they took possession of the land of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, 
and gave them into their hand with their kings and the peoples of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities in a rich land and took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. God, you are so good, yet we messed up so bad, but now... Look, you're still good. You're a God that's ready to forgive. You're gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You didn't forsake your people when they forsook you. Instead, you led them through the wilderness. You sustained them in the wilderness. You kept your promises of an inherited land, a people that numbered as the stars of heaven, the very promise that you gave Abraham at the beginning of all this, so that they were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Inhale. Even in our sin, God is gracious. You think we get it right, right? But be ready to exhale again. This is what I call now the hyperventilating part of the prayer, right? Because it's going to be a lot of quick exhale, inhale. Look at verse 26. Nevertheless, (laughs) they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. (laughs) In light of all that the people received from God, they still disobeyed. They rebelled even against the very one who had loved them. They threw away the law meant for their protection. They killed the ones who came to warn them. They committed great blasphemies, lies against the very one who had provided for them and protected them. And so God's hand is lifted, and the people suffer. Is that the end of the story? No, look at 27b. And in their time of suffering, they cried out to you, and you said, tough luck. You had three chances. That's not what he said. They cried out to you, and you heard them from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. Inhale. (laughs) His forgiveness, his grace, and his mercy. Ah, but here comes verse 28. Exhale. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you, and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yeah, we still get it wrong. But inhale quickly. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven, and many times you delivered them according to your mercies, and you warned them in order to turn back to your laws. Ah, inhale, he keeps forgiving. But then exhale, because yet they acted presumptuously again and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Exhale. But then quickly inhale. Finally one. The final nevertheless in verse 31, nevertheless, after all of this, God, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and a merciful God. And it brings them to the place in which they stand at the water gate in that very day. You hear it? Can you resonate with it? The goodness of God and your rebellion. The grace of God to Stauffer, and yet he still turns his back. But God is still good, and and it brings them even to the very place in which they stand on a ground that has been, uh, by God's hand and by God's favor, given to another land in which they are slaves, but yet there is gratitude because they're still standing by the mercy of God. They've been allowed to return to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the wall, and now rebuild a nation, and it leads to one final plea in this text that starts in verse 32. I think they get it, and so they say, Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, 
upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. For you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them, even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them and in the large and rich land that you've set before him, they, before them. They did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. And then this dynamic statement that they make, Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy, to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. And he repeats it, behold, we are slaves. And its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule our bodies and over our livestock as they please. And we are in great distress. The people acknowledge that, they, that God has acted faithfully and they have acted wickedly. So you gave us everything and we threw it away. The very land that now produces abundance for our enemies, that was supposed to be ours. But we turned from you and we lost it. In fact, we are slaves today in our own land. We are in great distress. Hear us. Save us. Inhale the goodness of God that we might exhale the ways in which we've failed him. Where does that take you this morning? Curious. What does it make you think about? What picture does this paint for you in your, in our world today? Some of you might go nationally, right? I think that's a natural place to maybe go, thinking about all that God has done for this nation and the many times we have turned our back on him leaving us as a people in many places across this nation that cry out in distress, oh God, save us. Some of you might go to the church, the the church as a whole, that has been promised that the, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, yet because of liberalism in the greater church, it seems as if we continually just slip away from truth. Maybe you even think of Covenant Church. You know, you yearn for those days in the late 70s. <laughs> I and mean, it was good then, right? God really did all kinds of things. But man, why, why do we still have missed opportunities, grumbling, and ongoing struggles among us? But you know what? I'm, I'm hoping more than Covenant Church, more than the church, more than even our nation, that many of you are having personal thoughts as we read through that text. That maybe you might have a Levite proverbially on one shoulder and another Levite on the other shoulder, and that one Levite is declaring to you all the ways in which God has been so great to you, and the other one going, yeah, but like you continue to blow it. Oh, but God is gracious and good. Oh, but you still didn't see it. Oh, but he's forgiven you about that too. Oh, but yeah, he's, uh, you, 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 you just can turn your back on it. And, and there's this, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not God and the devil. It's just two Levites going, this is what's really going on, man. The reality is, is that God blesses you, but you keep turning your back. And, and my hope is that this morning in that exercise, as we read that text, as we think about what the people walk through in Nehemiah 9, that we might think, of ourselves, still feeling our slavery, maybe to a particular sin, maybe to just an attitude of sin, even though we know the promises of God. Uh, Revival, quite frankly, is needed in all of those places. Our nation, our church and covenant church. But I have a thought this morning That revival is not going to happen in any of those places until revival happens in me. Until I recognize the goodness of God and confess my failures before him. 
So as we come to this table this morning, it provides an amazing opportunity for us to inhale (laughs) the goodness of God, right? This promise of God. The Father's love for you and providing a plan to send his Son to earth for you. The sacrifice of Jesus that he would give his life for you. The gift of the Holy Spirit that he would seek you out to implant upon your heart the truth of this table. That Christ came for you. That Christ died for you. That Christ rose for you. That he uh, ascended for you. And today he intercedes for you. Allow that Levite to share that good news for you as you come to this table. It's sufficient. It's good. It's awesome. It's life-giving. It's life-transforming. Hear it today. That God's faithfulness provides a safe place for you. And as we inhale that goodness, may we feel the safety of that place to confess our sins. Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. I read a good illustration this week. Uh, Living in sin, the illustrator said, is like living in a house with termites. (laughs) And if you just pretend like the termites aren't there, They're going to eat that house right out from under you, right? But if we recognize that the termites exist, and we begin to do the things like confession and fasting and repentance, and study in God's word, and prayer and the reality of inviting the spirit of God to come on us to thrust out those dang termites, we'll make progress. Not all at once, termites are nasty to get rid of. And so is our sin. But people of God, let's not just live with termites. Let's fight like crazy to rid them from our lives. That's what we're called to at this table. Is why Paul calls us to be careful and to examine ourselves as we come to this table. Allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us to an exhale that purges us of our sin and the guilt and shame that comes from it. Listen, I've recently heard some hard statistics that today in America, there have been more people that have left the church in the past 25 years than were transformed in all of those great revivals that I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon. Say that again. There are more people that have left the church in the last 25 years than all the people transformed in the first great awakening, the second great awakening, what happened in Chicago with D.L. Moody, and even in the Billy Sunday and Billy Graham crusades. There's lots of reasons for that. But one of them is we've become way too comfortable living with termites. Living in our sin. So I want this table to mess with you this morning. in a way that says God is good and gives you an invitation to say, here are my termites. Here are the things that are eating away. And God, I give them to you. I confess them to you. That you might cleanse me. That you might revive me. That you might not only change me, but change others through me. To remind us this table of the faithfulness of God while allowing us to breathe out our confession of how we've neglected to be faithful ourselves.